Hello everyone and welcome back. Now in the previous lecture, I introduced you to the phase line method. It's how we can understand dynamical systems of one dependent variable. I called it x, x of t in this case because it's a dynamic system. Now in this lecture, we're going to step things up and we're going to move to planar dynamical systems. That is dynamical systems with two independent variables. And we are going to look at the aptly named phase plane method. Now, the phase plane method is slightly more complex and you should understand why. We have another dimension to potentially move in that we didn't have when we had the phase line method. So this is where your understanding of calculus, your understanding of geometry and vector fields is going to come into play. Now, in order to walk you through this, I'm going to do it with an example. The example here is going to be very, very similar to what we saw with the hard and soft wood uh, example from two lectures ago. But in this case, I am going to use uh, a whale example. So I'm going to say let B equal to the number of blue whales. And I'm going to assume that F is equal to the number of fin whales. So I'm going to model blue and fin whale populations over time t. And I'm going to assume that these two whales compete with each other for resources, that they have a carrying capacity, that there are only so many of them can exist before they start competing with themselves in exactly the same way as we saw with the hardwood and softwood examples. So let me go ahead and write down a dynamic model for this. Again, we're going to assume a sort of logistic function, keep things a little bit simple, but again, biologically reasonable in many cases. And I will explain to you how the model was derived as we walk through each component. OK, so the growth rate, or the rate at which the blue whale population changes, dB dt, derivative of b with respect to t, this is going to be 0.05b. Remember from the hardwood softwood case, this is the assumption that your population grows proportional to how many you currently have. Okay, More blue whales means more in the future, potentially. This is a 5% growth rate. right? So whatever the population is now, we assume that they will grow 5% as time goes on. But, of course, they cannot grow forever. So what we will do is we will assume that the current habitat that these things live in can support a maximum of 150,000 whales. Okay. So what this says to me, when I read this like an English sentence, growth rate is 5% and I have a maximal possibility of 150,000 whales. Now, why do I know that that's a maximum? Because if B is larger than that value, this whole component becomes negative and starts pulling down the growth rate. So I could potentially increase up to my 150,000 if B is smaller than it. This is positive. I'm going up. But if I get bigger than it, I want to get pulled back down, right? Too many whales, not enough food, not enough resources, not enough room, and so I get pulled back down. But also, just like the hardwood and softwood problem, let's imagine that there is some uh, competition that's being uh, modeled inside of our uh, equation. We're going to use alpha to denote the competition parameter here. And so similarly, let's look at the fin whale population over time. Let's imagine that they have a slightly higher birth rate, and it's about 8%. And let's also assume that since fin whales are slightly smaller, they can support a lot more of them. So let's imagine they can support up to 400,000 fin whales in the region that we're looking in, okay? Basically the same dynamics if there's no competition here, okay? Grow up to your carrying capacity. But we are going to assume that there is again some sort of competition that brings these things down. 
Now, we need to have right, our state space in this case, BF is greater than or equal to zero. These populations have to be non-negative. And also, we have some initial conditions. Let's imagine that due to maybe uh, a century or more of whaling, that we start with not that many blue whales. 5,000 blue whales. And similarly for fin whales, let's imagine we only have 70,000 of them. Okay, so we're really, really far away from the carrying capacity of our habitat. And we can imagine that maybe that's due to whaling. So the question we can ask ourselves from a math modeling perspective, do we expect the whale populations to go extinct, similar to what we saw with the hardwood and the softwood example, right? It, will they die out? If we stop all of the whaling right now, will these populations die out? Or are they going to potentially persist up to uh, maybe some equilibrium state, right? Some uh, point of balance. Okay. Then the question is, how do we do this? How do we understand this? Well, let's think about this in the same way that we thought about phase line diagrams in the last video. This defines a vector field at every point in the BF plane. All right, so I'm hiding uh, time in the background here again, just like what I did with the phase line diagram. At every point in the BF plane, I can put them into these equations, time not necessary, and I can find a vector. That vector is these derivatives, and we know that vectors point in certain directions. For example, if I put in a value of B and F and this thing is positive, that tells me that my blue whale population is increasing at that point. Similarly, I could do the same thing down here. If I put in B and F maybe, and this thing is negative, then that tells me that my fin whale population would be decreasing, right? And I can use vectors to denote increasing or decreasing. So for example, if I have a vector that looks like this in the BF plane, this is both of them increasing. Or alternatively, I could have something that looks like this, B is still going right, it's increasing, but now F is going down, so F is decreasing, right? And if I want to just do one more for exposition, if I did this, B is decreasing, I'm pointing backwards in B, and because this is supposed to be horizontal, F is not changing at all, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to essentially use this vector definition here in order to get a macroscopic view of what my differential equation actually looks like. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to sketch out what are called the null clines. Okay, so null clines. They are when you set each one of these components to zero, but not both of them. Remember, steady states need both of these things equal to zero. A null cline is each one individually. So the first null cline is this. 0.05b, 1 minus b over 150,000 minus alpha bf is equal to zero. That is null cline number one. Okay, so what does that represent? Let's think about this geometrically first. Every point on this set is going to represent a point where the blue whale population is not changing. That means that my vectors at each point on this line are going to be purely vertical. They're either pointing positively in the F direction or negatively in the, X, in the F direction. They have no B component because B is equal to zero. Same principle that I used right down here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make an assumption for my model. Okay, so assuming, let's assume that 400,000 is less 
than 0 0.05 over alpha, okay? So that means that alpha has to be relatively small. The effect of competition between these two things is small. Now, why is it that I needed that? Well, you'll see in just a moment, but let's actually sketch out this line. So first of all, this is either the B equal to zero line, that's just this line right here, or if I factor a B out of this thing, I get a line that looks like this. Okay? So, let me sketch out the other null line before we start putting vectors on this thing. The other null line is 0.08F, 1 minus F over 400,000 minus alpha BF, okay? So, I forgot to put some uh, values on here. In this case, this is 0.05 over alpha, and this case right here, this point is 15, 150,000, sorry. So let's indicate those. And then let's draw the other one on here. The other one is going to look like this. This is my 400,000. And this is my 0 0.08 over alpha. Okay, so why is it that I needed to make this assumption? Well, this assumption guarantees that there is an equilibrium point right here. Okay, so remember the intersection of these lines represents an equilibrium point because it's places where both of these null clines are zero, right? And that is exactly what I need to find for equilibrium. Okay, so this guarantees that there's a coexistence equilibrium state inside of my model. Okay, so what I would like you to do when you are done watching this video, go back and make the opposite assumption. Okay, so imagine that 400,000 is bigger than 0 0.05 over alpha and try and sketch out the phase plane in that case. Okay, so once you complete this video, go ahead and try that. Now another piece of the model is that, of course, we have the extinction state down here. So now, Let's ask ourselves, what do the vectors look like on each of the null clines? Okay, well the first, this is null cline one. It's the first one that I drew. In that case, the B component of every vector is zero. So that means that all vectors are pointing either straight up or straight down. I'm not going to be concerned with lengths of vectors. All I care about are directions. That's the only thing that we're interested in here, okay? This is a, called a direction field. So, in this case, if I am on this line between here and here, my vectors are positive. They're pointing upwards in F. How do I know that they're pointing upwards in F? Because between these, uh, between when uh, B is smaller than 150,000 and uh, between this point, uh, I know that my F, DF, DF DT equation is positive. Similarly, as I cross over this thing, my DF DT equation becomes negative, and therefore vectors start pointing downwards. Okay? Similarly, if I am on the second null cline, then my df dt component is zero. There is no vertical component to my, no, uh, to my vectors on that line. The only thing that they can do is point to the left or point to the right. And so when I am on this piece of it, all my vectors are pointing to the right. And when I am on this piece of it, all my vectors are pointing to the left. Okay. So, in this case, now we can use this information to fill things in. So first of all, if f is equal to zero, so f is equal to zero, 
that makes this equation completely zero as well. I'm still on a null climb. And I essentially have a phase line diagram. So I can also sketch on some vectors along the B axis. If I, I mean, I can already get information out of this thing. If I have less than, uh, sorry, if I have no fin whales, I can see that I will converge into the carrying capacity for the blue whales. I mean, this is at the cost of the fin whales going extinct though. Okay, similarly, I am coming down when I am on this null cline. I am always moving towards the carrying capacity of the fin whales. So again, if there's no blue whales to compete with them, B is equal to zero, all I'm left with is a single equation all of this is equal to zero and I am stuck on the F axis and everybody is moving in towards that carrying capacity. The whales will grow until they can no longer support their own population. Okay, so now what happens? What happens if maybe I'm in here? Well, if I am, maybe we can just denote this coexistence state by these little lines here. So if I'm in this square underneath, that means that when I'm to the left of this thing, all my vectors are pointing right. And when I'm under it, all my vectors are pointing up. So any vector that's going to be in this little square down here is going to be pointing up and to the right, up and to the right. This is something that takes a little bit of practice. This is not easy to do. But essentially, how I know that is based on my null climbs. If you want to, if it makes things easier for you, you can pick values down here and put them in and see if you get positive or negative entries. And that might help you to do a little bit of sketching. Okay. Then, once I cross this line but stay under the null cline, I'm still pointing up, but I'm pointing to the left. So I might be looking like this. Right? And the first thing I want you to note here, these don't have to be perfect. You just want to get a feel for what things are doing. Okay, so what happens if I cross over the null cline and I'm in between? Everybody's moving left and everybody's now moving down. And so in this case, I am going to have vectors that look like this. And then over here, we are moving down and inwards. And similarly, once I catch myself in between here, right, so again, if you're having trouble with this, Try and go ahead and make a little table of values if you want. Plug in some values of B uh, and F to see how things go. So let's see this. And similarly, you know, over here, we're kind of pointing this way. Over here, we're pointing this way. Now, you can see, you know, it's not the prettiest picture in the whole wide world. That's okay, right? Because it allows me to get all of the information that I really want in the same way that a phase line diagram would. Now, what is it that I can see from my picture here? Everybody seems to be pushing me into the middle, right? So remember what all, each one of these vectors actually represents. It's telling you the direction that a solution would be heading in, right? These are tangent vectors, if you want to go back to your calculus class. So it says that if I start with a solution here, I'm going to start kind of pushing myself in and I might sort of follow something and it keeps just pushing me up and you can see everybody is really, really focused in on this coexistence state, right? We're all kind of focusing in. It's like all cameras and eyes have been turned towards coexistence here. Same thing if I start with a population way down here, what's happening? I keep growing and I keep growing and I keep growing until I get there to the coexistence state. I don't know exactly what's going on here. We'll go deeper into the analysis later on in this class. 
But for now, we're going to use a little bit of vector calculus intuition. I don't know exactly what the solutions to these things look like. I'm just using my little vector field here to get a feel for it. So same thing, if I come in here, maybe my solution looks like it's increasing up and it gets, you know, it gets pulled into my coexistence state. If I start way up here, lots of fin whales, not many blue whales, I get sort of pulled down into my equilibrium at my coexistence. So if we think about where we actually started, we said that we measured the blue whale population to be 5,000, so somewhere you know, way down here, and the fin whale population somewhere around here, around 70,000. Uh, not to scale, obviously, but what's gonna happen? The populations are gonna grow, right? In this region, all the vectors are pointing up and to the right. So my populations of my whales will continue to grow until at least it looks like, visually, I'm going to hone in on that coexistence state. So, in this case, at least I have a graphical method that can help me out and tell me a little bit of information and say, you know, without doing a, a whole lot of math, it seems like my population for my blue and fin whales is going to grow to a nice coexistence, you know, a balanced steady state in this ecosystem, a place where both of them can exist, a place where the predation, uh, or the, the competition between them is balanced out by their own growth year after year, right? They're not doing any competition anymore for resources. It's completely balanced by this birth-death process. Now, before we conclude, the last thing of this is I made the assumption that this is true. What I would like you to do, as I said earlier, is restart the problem with the opposite inequality. That's going to put this intersection down below here and it's also going to put this intersection over here a little bit and what I want you to try and figure out is if the conclusions still hold. Can you still get a coexistence state in which all of these vectors point towards it and you know from that what would you expect the populations to, to, to behave like in this case? Now remember, this comes down to how small the competition parameter alpha actually is. Remember, to make this thing bigger, I need alpha to be huge here. Uh, sorry, very, very small, pardon me. And so if alpha is very small, that means the blue whales and the fin whales aren't really competing all that much with each other. But if alpha is big, this is not going to be true. That means there's a lot of competition, and so we want to ask ourselves, is it still possible to have coexistence here? or Maybe the blue whales drive the fin whales out, or the fin whales drive the blue whales out, or maybe they both drive each other out into extinction, right? So I leave these as problems for you to, to get some practice with, with these direction fields, and I'll see you in the next lecture.